Hey, everybody. Welcome. Thank you for joining us for the Owler Insight webinar, Unlock the Secret to Irresistible Outreach and Skyrocket Your Response Rates. I'm your host, Alex Stone, Marketing Manager at Owler. And I know you're thinking, like, why is a marketing manager on here? Well, I sell to salespeople and I work with salespeople a lot. So but I'm always willing to learn new things about sales. And that's why our lovely guest, Armand Farouk, is here founder of 30 Minutes of President's Club. Thank you for joining us, Armand. I'm stoked to be here. And what I can say is, Alex, you've probably unsubscribed for, from more cold emails than anyone in the world as a marketer. And so if anything, you are the voice of the recipient of many of our emails, good and bad. And I can be the person who's teaching us how to send those emails as well. So I think we got a dynamic duo today, but I'm stoked for this one. I'm, I'm excited as well. Armand, I know like many people know you from 30 MPC, but for those of you, you know, for those of the audience and even for me, can you share a little bit about your journey and kind of like how did you become such an expert seller? Yeah. So by background, I won't give you the full, full resume, but I actually started <laughs> my sales career back in college selling insurance. And I never sent any emails when I was selling insurance. I only made cold calls. And then I realized that that was like a pretty inefficient way of prospecting. And so then I got to a company called Carta and I found that if I just sent two emails for every one cold call that I made and I tailored those emails effectively and found the right triggers to catch CFOs the moment that they raised or they came across their fundraising anniversary, I was like, if I can time the correct email with the correct trigger. This is like, I, I might not even have to make cold calls. Instead, I did both and did super well at Carter. I became their number one rep. And then I ultimately took over their whole SDR team. And then I became the VP of sales at a company called Pave, um, where I was running an organization from SDRs to AEs to sales engineers to RevOps all across the board. So I started cutting my teeth in the prospecting world. I got really good at that. And then I scaled that up and was running a team of full closers up until about uh, December, at which point I went full time on 30 MPC. So that's the whole roundabout story. Love it. Love it. And so you were doing sales triggers before, I think like that's early days before anyone else was using sales triggers. Yeah. Before sales triggers were invented, right? I'm, I'm the hipster of sales triggers. Isn't that right? But yeah, the, the number one thing that I, I did that I found that was most effective and where, where I find that reps just want to run and they just want to pump out activity. The way that it made sense to me is like the way I'm going to start my outreach is I'm going to look at what deals are closing and I'm just going to reverse engineer those patterns into prospecting messaging, as opposed to trying to ask someone uh, if they went to USC or to this, this or that, and come up with like nice tailoring. I always preferred trigger-based tailoring, which is going to be a lot of what we talk about today. That's awesome. I love I love working smart, not hard. That's the, <laughs> that's, that's ultimate right. efficiency. So let's talk about research. I know a lot of salespeople kind of have a love hate relationship with research. What are your thoughts here? You know, <laughs> like should they I hate research? <laughs> <laughs> I have a hate hate relationship with research, but it's a necessary evil in the world. Okay, and so here here's um, a hot take. Like I don't care if you're an enterprise. I don't care if you're an SMB. I don't care what you're doing. You should be able to research a prospect in under five minutes, full stop. And that is if you really know what you are looking for. And you might be able to do it in like a minute with Owler, for example, right? And the reason that people take way too long to research accounts is they sprawl out and they turn it into into the wormhole with Morgan Freeman today, where they sprawl out into every possible thing you could possibly find in an account. But what I always recommend that people do is call find the top five things that lead someone to buy your solution. Find the top five things. Stack rank them in order of importance. And when you pick up an account or a prospect, look for those five things in order. And the moment you find one or two, stop because first is best on that list. And usually I can find something meaningful in under two minutes. That's how I prefer to do research under five minutes and spend more of my time segueing that important research to an actual email. Okay. Okay. So those, we got five, five features that we want to focus on for our prospects, right? Um, can you repeat those one more time for the audience? Yeah. So let's use an example. 
yeah. for example. And so it's going to vary for whatever solution you're selling. If I was at Carta, so Carta was a company or still is a great company that helps companies manage their equity programs, their stock option programs, et cetera. The first trigger you would always look for is has this company raised a round of funding? Okay. If it is the anniversary of their funding, they need to get another valuation, which means that is like the best buying window because Carta sells valuations. So the first thing I'm doing is I pull up an account, right? I'm making sure that it's in my territory. I'm making sure it's the right employee account. And the first thing I pull up, boom, fundraising history. That's my first trigger, right? The second trigger that I'm looking for is I'm looking for batches of new hires. And so I'm looking at their growth on LinkedIn and I'm seeing, do they have double digit employee growth? And the reason for that is if they do, that means they're issuing a lot of new options as well. Mm -hmm. The third thing I'm looking for is have they raised a series B or C? Because if they raised a series B or C, they're probably being audited now. And that's the third most important thing is we help with a lot of the expense accounting. Again, I don't work for Carta anymore, but this is how we thought of it back then, right? And there are fourth, yeah. fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth triggers. But usually if I can get three meaty triggers like that, I don't even need the fourth or the fifth. And so yeah. if, they, if I know they're raising around, I'm not going to be talking about this audit thing yet, right? Because the fundraise is the first most important thing to find. So figure out what that is for your company. I had a different set for PAVE and we have a different set for 30 MPC too. Every business has triggers to buy, stack rank them and start there. I love that. I love that. Let's right. talk about those low hanging fruit because we're really here to tell people like, how are we going to up your response rates? How are we going to be more tactical doing your outreach. So let's tap into that. Bingo. All righty, folks. So we talked about low hanging fruit. While I'm explaining this, folks, I want you to punch in the chat right now. If you're researching an account or a person on LinkedIn, what are some things that you can pull out from the account or the person level while I riff on this? All right. So companies are designed for one of three reasons, save money, make money, or prevent you from getting sued, save money, make money, prevent you from getting sued. Those are the three things. Let's walk through the LinkedIn channel for making money. Okay. If I want to make money, if I'm selling a solution that helps people make money, for example, Aller helps people make money. What are the things that I could look for that would lead me to believe that the company is trying to make some more money on LinkedIn? Help me out in the chat. Number one, I might look for certain types of job postings. For example, I might look for a RevOps leader who has descriptions around enriching accounts with the most relevant information. That would be something that would lead to an hour buying process. I might look at things like, Brent, you're calling out activity, location, connections. To me, those are warm things. Those are ways that I can create warmth. I might go to someone's connections and see, do I have a second degree connection so I can get a referral to them? Antoine's hitting us with hiring reps right? If they're hiring 20 reps, they're probably focused on making money. A new product launch. Great. Nick, I can't believe Nick said something useful. Amazing. A new product launch, right? All of these things are in the world of making money. Wow. Opening a new region. Amazing. Now let's take it to another world. Okay. If I wanted to save money, this one's a little bit trickier. What are the types of things that I could look for on LinkedIn? If someone wants to save money, and I'm selling a solution like Carta, I might go look at their finance job postings. Or I might get off LinkedIn, and I might look at their Form 10K, if they're a public company, and I might look for words like profitability, or costs, or burn, or earnings per share, and if it's negative, what they're doing to improve earnings per share, right? So those are all the low hanging fruits of making money, saving money. And the last one is risk. We actually just got off of a 30 MPC webinar where we were drafting an email to Tim Cook, selling him privacy software. And what we were looking for in the 10K and on Google was we were looking for past data breaches that they've gotten before. And those are obviously things that help prevent risk, right? So those are some examples of low hanging fruit that I would use. What about like competitor data? Armand, is this something that you would consider low-hanging fruit as well? Yeah. So the there are different types of tailoring that I would use. Okay. So one form of low-hanging fruit is what's the trigger for someone to buy? 
But then the other form of low hanging fruit is how I pique their interest or how I convince them that I'm someone that's worth working with. So my favorite cold call opener is called the heard the name tossed around opener, right? And I might say something along the lines of, hey, we work with a few other sales tech companies like A, B, and C. It's Armand at 30 MPC. Have you heard her name tossed around? Right? So I can actually use that to build credibility in my cold call opener. I can use that in my cold email when I'm pitching, I hate that word, but when I'm pitching and say, we work with other sales companies like competitor A, B, or C, right? And help them solve this. And so the way this all comes together is your top five triggers is usually your first paragraph, right? Hey, notice you have seven job postings, right? Second paragraph, now I can pull in the parallel case studies or competitors that I work with to say, we've helped other people just like you solve that problem right? And that's how you can start to mix those two pieces together. And then you end with a low friction call to action. Okay. So that's kind of like, I wanted to segue into something where it's like, okay, we got all this research. We're, we're getting all these sales triggers. We're, we're looking at our competitor data. And then how do we put this stuff to work? How do we put it in action for us and, and really get a response from our prospect and really get them to, you know, react to our outreach? Yeah. How do we get them to react to our outreach? Right. And so uh, the, there are a lot of different spicy ways that you can do this. And I would encourage you all to think about the different uh, the different levels of altitude in the organization that you're reaching out to. And also like read your persona, because there are some folks who are more sensitive to this than others. Right. The first way that I can pique the interest is let's say I'm using competitors. Right. And I'm just going to use uh, two companies that are not relevant. They're not Aller competitors. They're not sales tech competitors. I'm going to go Pepsi and Coke. Okay. Pepsi and Coke are two competitors. And let's say that I'm emailing Pepsi and Coca-Cola is one of my current customers, right? I might have in my subject line, right? Coca-Cola is hiring too. Something like mm -hmm. that. That's going to get an open. Right, that's gonna get an open. Coca Cola's RC Cola is the dark horse, <laughs> right? That's if you're looking at a cheap competitor, RC Cola or uh, just Cola at Safeway, right? And so that might be what I put in my subject line. And then from there, I'm gonna start with that open tailoring sentence. So, Alexandra, to what we talked about before, yeah. is I'm gonna pull in some of those hiring pieces or those low hanging fruit that I saw on LinkedIn. And I might say, hey, notice that you're hiring XYZ reps, right? Or you're hiring this many sales reps or this many jobs open, et cetera. Let's say I'm a recruiting firm, right? My middle paragraph is when I'm going to put that trigger and tie it back to the subject line, which referenced the competitor, mm -hmm. right? In the space like sodas, the space is thriving. And we've helped folks like Coca-Cola, right? triple their sales force in the last six months, right? Not assuming you want to do the exact same, but it seems like hiring is also priority for you. And we have experience in this industry. Open to learning more. And so I can take the trigger and use the competitor as a proof point to explain how I am relevant in solving the problem that we identified in the original trigger. Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. And then how can this like sort of pour over into other areas of outreach? Is it just, um, can you use this technique just in email or are there other areas of outreach where you can use the same technique? Yeah. So a couple other places you can use this technique is my favorite is on the phone, right? So if I know that someone else is working with a competitor, the best way to do it is in the her name tossed around opener is, I mean, Alex, Alex I'm going to get you to sit up if you're Pepsi and I'm going to be like, Hey, uh, we work with a couple other food and bev companies like, um, you know, Coca-Cola, et cetera, et cetera. It's Armand at insert beverage selling company here. Have you heard her name tossed around? Right. The opener is going to work on point yeah. every time. And in, and a cold call is very, very similar to a cold email. It's just the way that you piece the information together is a little bit different. And if I were to continue going... I would typically ask you for permission and I'd be like, Hey Alex, I guess you're going to hate me. This is a total cold call. Can I get 30 seconds to tell you why I'm calling? And then you can tell me if it's relevant or not. Mm -hmm. Right. So I've explained the competitor. I've explained the context. 
And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to, just like the email, I'm going to weave that competitor into my value prop. I'm going to say like, look, I was doing research on y'all. And typically when you're hiring 10 folks in the food and bev space, that means your thing is tank it off. And like, it's a matter of, can you get enough people to distribute your thing? Right? Not a matter of, can you get enough customers? Right? We've helped other companies like Coca-Cola, like I mentioned on the front end, triple their workforce, yada, yada, yada. Right? I'm not assuming you're exactly like them, but it seems like you have a parallel set of problems that they might be working through. Are you open to talking? So I can take this exact same thing, translate it to a cold call. And that's when this stuff is the gift that keeps on giving is, I mentioned I hate research up front. Do it quickly. Find the low-hanging fruit, but then reuse the low-hanging fruit over and over and over again on emails, on calls, and across the account as well. Okay. So what you're doing is really like that intro is making sure you're relevant. And then on the phone where you're like, have you named my hear my name tossed around or on the email is saying like, I'm in your network, right? You're letting that prospect know that you're not a rando, right? And that you're someone that's relevant to both the things they do and into their, into their world. Bingo. hundred percent correct is a lot of times what people don't realize is when you're first receiving a cold call, what's funny is I actually thought you were calling me before this webinar, <laughs> Alex. And so I picked up the phone. I get probably like 20 cold calls a day and I feel bad. I cannot answer all of them, but the rep caught me and she gave me an opener and she was like, Hey, Armand, um, I looked you up on LinkedIn. Uh, did I catch you at a bad time? And I'm like, this is an Alex cold call. <laughs> I was like, I know it's not Alex it's cold caller. Um, and the reason is the moment you ask, how's your day going? Did I catch you at a bad time? They know no random stranger just shows up and they're like, how's your day going? Right. I know it's a sales pitch. And if you ask me, did you catch you at, did you catch me at a bad time? It's always a bad time. And again, I know you're a sales pitch. My goal with the heard the name tossed around opener to your point, Alex, is I want to create a sit up moment in the first five seconds of the cold call. Mm -hmm. And I want to break that pattern. My favorite opener at Carter was just saying that we worked with other portfolio companies and name dropping their investor. I would just say, hey, Alex, we work with a few other Sequoia portfolio companies. It's uh, Arma and Carta. Have you heard her name tossed around? Or I would do it with competitors too, right? Uh, I won't name drop some of, some, of our, our comp some of our wonderful sponsors who may or may not compete against each other, but there are folks in the sales tech space that do compete with each other, right? And it is really validating to hear those other names working with 30 Minutes to President's Club. Oh. So name drop those up front. Yeah, already. Just when you said that, you know, when you're talking about all your portfolio companies, that, that provides like an authority. I was like, okay, I'm willing to listen to this because maybe maybe it's not a sales call. Maybe it's something relevant totally. pertaining to me, right? Um, we we're talking about like different touches and I've heard um, a recent stat say about like 95% of voicemails are listened to. Do you think enough uh, people are leaving voicemails like and using that as a, as a form of outreach? Um, to their prospects. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. 95% like, of people are listening to voicemails. I definitely do that. I never answer sales calls. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm that person. All right. In the chat, in the chat. Uh, fair enough. I also don't answer as much. So connect rates are going down. Connect rates are like sub 10%. They've been single digits for quite some time. They've gotten worse since COVID, right? In the chat, do you read, listen, or delete voicemails? Read, listen, delete. Okay. Here's what I like to do for voicemails. Okay. The first thing that I like to do is I like to leave a 15 second voicemail. And the 15 second voicemail is only going to be the context that I have about them. So I'm going to take that competitor name, Alex, and I'm going to use that in my voicemail. And I'm basically going to use nothing else. And so what it sounds like is I might be like, Hey, Alex, um, we work with a few other food and bev companies, um, folks like Coca-Cola, et cetera. It's Armand at 30MPC. I'm going to send you an email after this. Um, no need to uh, re call me back on this voicemail. Just give me a reply back there. Mm -hmm. Bye. Oh, and so what I'm doing is I'm only referencing the context. I'm only referencing the competitor. And you're like, oh, this person works with other people in my space. I'm not pitching in a voicemail. My goal is to get them to read an email where there is a fully tailored pitch already in there and buy myself a reply. If I don't get a reply after that first one, I leave one more voicemail. And what I do is I leave a 30 second voicemail because the context only one didn't work. 
and I'll say the exact same thing, but I'll add a problem to it. And so I'll say, hey, Alex, we work with a few, few other food and bev co's, um, like Coca-Cola, it's arm at 30 MBC. The reason that I'm reaching out is XYZ problem, right? I don't know if that's relevant, but I'm going to send you an email. If it's not, would you mind just replying and let me letting me know that it's not interesting? So on the second one, I include both the tailoring and the problem. And again, I'm pushing back to the email and I'm saying, hey, if it's not interesting, just let me know. I'm just trying to get a response. I'm not trying to sell them the whole thing on a voicemail. Okay. Um, and then the third time I like to not leave a voicemail. But the reality is the, the trick question to read, listen, or delete. Most people don't delete. Most people I find at least open it and they skim the transcription and that's what I do. And by leading with the yeah. context of the competitor, that's the first thing that pops up in the transcript. So they're going to see Coca-Cola and that's what's going to drive the reply. We have a question in the chat that says, isn't the opener also very salesy? Uh, same as how are you from example company? Ah, that's a, that's an interesting take. So I actually think the permission based opener is like pretty salesy. And, and the reason for that is one, everyone's using it right now. And then two, it's basically just explicitly calling out that it's a cold call. My goal is with the heard the name tossed around opener is to not feel like a cold call. And so I'm not, the tone is really, really important where I'm not going to be like, hello, Alex, we work with a few of your colleagues in X, Y, and Z. It's Armand at 30 MPC. Have you heard our name tossed around? The tone is as if I was getting a referral to you, right? The way that I actually came up to this was when I was selling insurance. We worked with a few other partners of a certain law firm in LA, and I just started calling down the office. Yes. And I was like, hey, we work with a few other partners in the office. Um, it's Armand at Northwestern. Have you heard her name tossed around? And I'm like, you've heard her name tossed around, right? We work with a few other Sequoia portfolio companies. It's Armand at Pave. Uh, heard her name tossed around, right? We work with a few other food and bevcos like uh, Coca-Cola. It's Armand at 30 MPC. Have you heard, heard her name tossed around? It's like, you, you've heard of us before, right? So it's meant to be like not salesy sort of the anti-pitch. I think there's also like a certain level of like confidence that you're entering, right? When when someone calls yeah. you and they're really confident in what they're saying, you kind of just want to listen to them. Um, and I think that, yeah. that goes to whether you use that tactic or any other tactic to get someone's attention is, is really like bringing that confidence through that, hey, I'm someone that is like, you know, worthy of your time. Uh, that always yeah. works, right? You always, you know, at least give them a second to say what else they have to say. Yeah, you got to the the tone is really, really important on cold calling and not to throw out BS statistics, but like 80 percent of the job folks is just sounding sounding casual, confident and getting rid of the telemarketer voice on your cold calls. A couple of common things that I see people screw up very frequently are uptones and speeding up. So an uptone is uh, this is Armand from 30 MPC. Have you heard her name tossed around? <laughs> right. We're a cap table management platform. Sounds like you're asking a question. Sounds like you're you're like un, un, very uncertain of yourself. The other thing is the moment, especially if someone says, I'm in a meeting or if I'm jumping to the next thing, they start to speed up and they start to stammer and sweat and stutter and all of this stuff. And the number one thing you got to get comfortable doing is the moment a cold call gets hot, no pun intended, <laughs> slow down. Your reaction to a visceral reaction needs to be the opposite. Someone speeds you up, you got to slow them down and you got to show them that you're not rocked with them. That's great. I used to do door to door sales like a long time ago. I did. No way. I was selling solar and yeah. I hated it. I hated every. I hated How did you I would open? Knock on the door and I, I was like, I hope this person doesn't answer. And I think I would, <laughs> I would do the same thing with that's why I'm a marketer. Uh, oh you know, but it was the same thing. Someone would answer the door and I'd be like, oh, you know, like whatever, going through the pitch and sounding absolutely not confident in what I was saying. Um, and either they would just be nice or just shut the door in my face. But well, that's very, that's not very nice. But. <laughs> nice or that. But yeah, I understand the, the struggle. Uptones, um, being questionable about what you're saying is, is a no no. Can you talk about some other sort of things people should avoid, whether this is an email or? Um, yeah. voicemail, cold calling, like what are some common mistakes um, people are doing all the time that is just sort of turning off the prospect? Yeah. So while I answer this one, folks, riff it in the chat. 
what are the different things that you think are the the deadly sins of cold calling or cold email okay so let's start with cold email deadly sins of cold email starting with the subject line don't sell in your subject line don't put a full sentence in your subject line okay for example if we're using a competitor as our trigger or if we're using an investor portfolio i'm not going to put we helped Coca-Cola hire 10 more people in my subject line. That is clearly a sales pitch. I'm going to say something like Coca-Cola's hiring plan. Something like that. You're like, oh, that's interesting if I'm Pepsi, right? Or I might say Coke versus Pepsi hiring. Little things to pique the interest, right? So three to four word subject lines, no long subject lines, no selling in your subject line, no full sentence subject lines, okay? Nick called it out in the chat. You do not want uh, the email itself to be longer than one phone's length worth of text. What that usually means is three bodies of text, no more than three lines each when read on your phone. The way that flows is the context or that trigger and the problem they have. Paragraph two, the solution and the proof point, including that competitor, and then paragraph three, a low friction call to action, like open to learning more. And that's the last deadly sin that I'll call out for cold emails is, Subin, you called out a great one. No personalization is like an obvious, like the, the whole point of this is how to stand out in cold outreach. That's a clinic on how to not stand out in cold outreach. It's just unpersonalized emails, okay? But the last one is not having a low friction call to action and asking for heavy things like, please let me know when you are available for a 30 minute meeting with our specialist, which is literally a call to action that I got yesterday inside of my inbox, which is why it's top of mind. Those are the cold emailing deadly sins. Uh, Alex, do you want us to go into cold calling or do you want me to pause there? Uh, let's, let's hear cold calling too. This is, this is great stuff. All right. Cold calling deadly sins. Throw them in the chat. Okay. So absolute worst cold call is nonprofits. Every single one says, wow, glad to hear a friendly voice. I feel like I've been talking to a voice. <laughs> this is funny. Okay. <laughs> cold calling bad habits. How's your day going? Did I catch you at a bad time for the reasons that we've already discussed, right? They know. They know you're a cold caller. You've either got to lean in or lean out. If you want to lean into the cold call, lead with a permission-based opener and just call out, hey, you're going to hate me for this one, but it's a total cold call, right? Can I get 30 seconds to tell you why I called? They know, right? So you might as well gain their respect by calling it out. If you're going to lean out, you go with the heard the name toss around opener, which is my goal is to get you to forget that this is a cold call, right? Uh, not knowing your opener is a terrible mistake, to your point, Casey. You should probably know. <laughs> That you're your your opener. You should also not be shocked to your point. You might be the uh, yeah, you might have the Alex effect of the door. Yeah, yeah, not, which is when someone actually opens the door, you're like, oh no, what do I say now? Right. The worst is it's like taking a cold shower by accident. Is on your first cold call, someone picks up. Everyone's had that moment when someone picks up on your first cold call. Be ready for it. Okay. Expect someone to pick up on your first cold call because you're almost like not ready for it. The way that you can do this is another common mistake is people don't have the most common objections that come up down pat. Okay. And what I recommend everyone do is find your top five most common objections for your cold call. And folks that the top five co most common objections, they don't really change company to company. It's like, not interested. Call me in six months. I have it taken care of. There's a competitor. I'm in a meeting, right? Those are mostly the, the objections. Know those ones down. So it's literally someone hits you with an objection. You're like, if this, then that. If this, then that. If this, then that. And cold calling just becomes an assembly of these different portions of talk tracks that you've practiced over and over and over again. I'm going to chime in and say, when I do get a cold call and I answer, because <laughs> I think it's supposed to be something else. And I'm trying so hard to get, I'm polite, but I'm trying to get off the phone and I'm like, Oh, I don't have time. Or when you meet someone who can handle every single one of your objections, you're like, well, okay, I'll take the meeting on Tuesday you know, <laughs> or whatever. Like I've, I've had a couple of phone calls where they, they, 
rebuttal each and every one of my objections. I'm a little bit pissed <laughs> that that's happening. You're like, come on. <laughs> like, God damn it. You know, can't get off the phone. But, you know, I'll take the meeting with them or I'll give them the time of day. Cause I was like, I just, or like, if I, if I really am not a good fit, I'll just tell them like, Hey, you're really good at sales. Like I literally just, I'm, I'm not the right person. Like I, I can't buy your product. <laughs> so I appreciate that. <laughs> Thank you for making it easier on the sales reps of, of, that we're all out in the field. Here. Uh, but that's a great one. Um, something else. I think we missed something though. Um, cold, like cold outreach on LinkedIn, right? Like what are the no nos there? Like what, what is, What's the process there? I feel like we we didn't touch on that. I know a lot of reps are doing yeah. outreach on LinkedIn. God knows I get 100 in mails a day. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So a couple a couple common ones and I can rant on like LinkedIn connect and pitch outreach. A lot of people give the advice of don't connect and pitch. But I think that's just like the the lazy LinkedIn influencer thing to say. Frankly, I don't think that's particularly tactical or helpful advice. First of all, what is a connect and pitch? It's a connection. I may or may not have a message. And it's a long copy-pasted thing, right? It's a long copy-pasted pitch usually. But what do you do instead? Most people don't give a very effective answer. So here's what I recommend that you do with LinkedIn outreach. First thing, most common mistake that people make in their connection request is writing a connection request. Hot take. I don't personalize connection requests at all. I accept every single connection request that is blank. If there's some sort of mini pitch or notice this or yada, 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 I'm almost certainly going to decline it with the exception of if it's a 30 MPC fan and they say, I love your podcast or something. Those ones I always accept, obviously, right? But sometimes I accidentally click X and I have to find them and reconnect with them because I'm just like, I see message and i'm like i know you're trying to like tailor something mm -hmm. right so blank connection request the time it takes to write a good tailored linkedin connection is not going to meaningfully increase your connection rates okay the second mistake is once the connection actually occurs people throw a massive pitch so your linkedin messages should be really short they should be link free because when you type a link into LinkedIn, no pun intended, it blows up the link, right? So if you include your Calendly, it has literally, you read the message and all you can see is the Calendly. It says 60 minutes with Armand Faro, right? Don't include any links. Think of your LinkedIn in the same way that we thought about voicemails earlier, where I'm gonna say, hey, Alex, we work with a few other Sequoia portfolio companies. Um, I'm not gonna do the whole connect and pitch thing, but I sent you a note. Did you get it by chance? I'm not going to reissue the pitch on LinkedIn. I'm going to use LinkedIn as this friendly place to remind them that I'm not a rando. And I'm going to be like, hey, I'm not going to do that here. Did you get my note? And usually what will happen is you'll get a reply back on the email. Mm. Or someone will say like, hey, I'm not interested. As opposed to if you pitch, they're just going to be like, stop emailing me. Stop LinkedIn-ing me. You're pitching me everywhere and it's freaking annoying. Use LinkedIn as an ability to change and ease the pressure and just force a reply, not force another pitch. You know, I love that. I had someone send me, I don't know, they did a connect and pitch. That Well, they connected with me, then they pitched me and then they sent me this long LinkedIn message, like tell me what their software does. And it was like nothing but jargon. And yeah. I was just like, hey, man, I don't know what the heck you're selling me. Can you like just say it in like plain English, like fifth grade level, yeah. like what it is you're selling? And then he explained. I was like, OK, cool. I was like, we're not a good fit for that. But when you reach out to people, it's like tell them at a fifth grader level, like what your product is. Yeah. I have no time. What are you doing? It, you know, I was like, what is this even? What are you even selling me? You know, but it, that, like you said, yeah. if it's just a few words, it keeps from the confusion. I often think less is more. Um, it makes me more inclined to like you. I was like, oh, okay, yeah. Um, I'll hear what you have to say now that you're not bombarding me with all this messaging, right? I appreciate that you're saying that, especially as a marketer, because a lot of times what happens is we get these really beautiful designed emails, right? And these design emails from Nordstrom or from Allbirds or insert your favorite brand here, right? It's a lot of 
the language around the texture of this, this or that, or it's a lot of features and pitches of retail stuff, for example, right? But a sales email needs to be extremely short to your point, extremely jargon light, and it should feel like someone is describing it in plain human English. And it should lead with the problem that you have. So two pieces that Alex is calling out there that are super important. The first piece is it needs to be, it needs to start with something about you, right? Because you're like, I don't know if we have this problem. I don't even understand it, right? It needs to start with something about Alex, right? And what you know about Alex and how that turns into a problem before you talk about any product. That's the first paragraph that Alex needs to see is it needs to be like, yo, like, this is independent of the product. This is research that you've done about me and it's a problem that I have. And then the second sentence should literally just say, this is how we solve that problem. And you barely have to talk about your product. And then a low friction call to action. I love that. I love that. I do write some automated cadences. So I'm learning. <laughs> I'm learning. I love that. We're guilty. We're guilty of it. Um, we have an interesting question, and I think we should touch up on this before we move forward, is like, what do you think of voice notes or video messages? I think that's something I haven't actually heard you talk about yet. Um, yeah. Give some insight. Yeah. <laughs> I'll, I'll just share my actual opinions. <laughs> um, so I've gotten some like voice notes on LinkedIn, and Every time I get one, I'm expecting like a pretty janky voice note, especially if there's like a no, no context voice note. I'm like, oh, God, like what if it's just a person screaming into their mic kind of thing? There's just something that sort of creeps me out about like the cold voice native voice note on LinkedIn. I'll tell you a couple places where I like it. So first of all, mid sales cycle, love voice notes, love voice notes. And I love uh, mid deal cycle using a lot of videos, right? And mid deal cycle doesn't necessarily mean that the multi threading and the prospecting is done, right? I can use voice notes or I can use voice notes and videos to pull more people into the cycle and use videos to be like, hey, we've met with your team. Here are some things that we've discussed with this department over here, right? And I thought I would bring you up to speed in a recap. Are you open to weighing in on this yourself? Perhaps we can schedule time to like bring you up to speed on like how we're working with your team, right? So you can use that video to help multi-thread because you have some context because you're actually in a deal cycle now, right? The natural question is like, what do you do with video prospecting, right? I am okay with it. Uh, typically, I prefer to send my video prospecting stuff over LinkedIn and just send a traditional cold email. That's my take. I prefer sending video prospecting over LinkedIn, traditional cold email, just because it takes a long time to do it at scale. And oftentimes people just, they're not, they're not going to open your video if you haven't piqued their interest enough and a cold email needs to do that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. All right. So we talked about like using LinkedIn, voicemail, email, and cold calling, of course. Is there a specific yeah. structure to all that? Like, is there a play that you use? Is there, is it like email whatever i'll let you tell us <laughs> but like what's the structure yeah. with the say it's like a brand new prospect right it's my first time reaching out to them what's the play here what's the framework with all those four touches totally and so now we'll, we'll weave it all together and i do use video in my outbound sequences um, and i'll explain where that comes in which it comes in on a later linkedin step okay so first batch there's a concept called run the triple email call linkedin we're going to hit them all, all three channels. Okay. So day one, I'm going to send them a cold email. It's a tailored cold email. I'm going to pull up that cold email while I'm cold calling them. I'm going to make a phone call. And that email should have the research that I pulled in. And I can use that in my Heard the Name Toss around opener. And then I'm going to send that blank connection request. That's day one. Two days later, on day three, I'm going to bubble it up. Email and call. I'm not going to do anything on LinkedIn yet because they probably still haven't connected with me. Day five, I'm going to bubble up that same first email thread again because it had some good juicy tailoring in it. And I want to give that tailoring three times to be seen, right? So we went email call LinkedIn day one, email call day three, email call again, day five, six, seven, depending on how intense you want to be, 
right? The last thing is that in that third batch, we're going to add LinkedIn. And that's when my first LinkedIn message is going to come through. And again, that first LinkedIn message, if someone is connected on day five, is just saying like, hey, we work with other Sequoia portfolio companies. Did you get my email? Goals to all drive back to the email. Mm -hmm. yeah. okay? So at this point, I've sent my first tailored email. I've sent a bubble up, a bubble up on both email on and LinkedIn. And I've been calling in parallel. I'm going to then in my third, in my next batch of outreach, I'm going to do another cold email, but a new subject. Mm -hmm. So I've sent three cold emails already. I'm now going to switch the problem. And I'm going to write an email based on the second most relevant trigger yes. if I had one. If not, it will be something automated. And again, I'm going to call them right after that, right? And so it goes email call, email call, right? And on that last call, I'm going to add my final LinkedIn touch, which might be a tailored video on their profile, which is me scrolling on their LinkedIn profile and be like, hey, I figured it might be easier to show you how I think I can help you. Um, I promise I'll keep this brief. Here's a 45 second video on like how I think we can be helpful to you at XYZ company, right? At that point, I start to phase out cold calls and every four or five days we're adding an email until we get to about touch 14 or so. So between email call and LinkedIn, you've got maybe six or seven emails, four or five calls and three LinkedIn touches. And at that point, I'm starting to move into more of like a breakup type of cadence. Oh. Um, and I see a bunch of questions around bubble up lines and we can talk about those. Yeah. I actually had a question about bubble ups too. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, so a couple different types of bubble ups. So you send that first email, there's a good tailoring. There's a problem in it. Two days later, the most common bubble up right now is just any thoughts, right? If you're cold calling, I actually like to say, Hey, just gave you a buzz. Happen to see this one. Right. And so that's a nice variation because it tells them that I'm calling them. It's a great way to follow up your calls and your emails. The next bubble up, I don't like to just say thoughts again. It's sort of weird. It's sort of annoying at that point. Right. Sometimes what I'll do is if there is a like link to a little like landing page or a demo portal or demo video, right? I might say like, hey, sometimes it's better seen than than read, right? Here's a link to our tour portal. Did you get a chance to see my last two notes? Right? Something like that. Mm -hmm. That just like changes the messaging a little bit and continues to add and deposit value, right? That's how you do the front end of your sequences bubble ups. The back end starts to be more of like breakup bubble ups where I'm asking things like, hey, am I in the wrong place? Right? Are you the wrong person for this? Sometimes our type of solution lives in X, Y, or Z place, right? And that's another bubble up but it's changing the way that I'm trying to get a response by saying like, hey, is, is this not your thing, right? And then I start to push away and I start to be like, hey, I'm getting the sense that this isn't relevant, right? Would you mind giving me the thumbs up or thumbs down? And then I do the final breakup at the end. I love that. I love that you do the final breakup. <laughs> I love the buildup right there. Yeah. Um, hopefully that clarified for the audience as far as bubble ups. Um, yes, the session will be available later for review. We'll send out a recording to everybody. Um, and then I just have a few more, like one more question before we sort of break it up. And it's, 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 it's about adoption. Like you have this framework. We just talked about these opening touches, using low hanging fruit, using triggers. Um, how, how can we really get sales teams to really adopt this? Like is the responsibility on the leadership to teach their teams this? I know you've been a VP. Like, what have you done in the past? Something I'm genuinely curious about. Um, yeah. Yeah. The, the, thing that, the thing that helps the most is you can run a million trainings and stuff like that. But um, I think the team, what my teams have respected out of me in the past is I was fortunate enough at, at both Carta and at PAVE to have started selling individual deals. And I had been able to walk the walk and show that this prospecting was working at scale. Right. Mm -hmm. And so the number one thing that I find is most helpful is have the voices of the top reps be your champions to the org. The way that I would typically turn around a team is if I had to do a turnaround in the past, which I've had to is I try to find the two or three people that are leading at the front and make them the heroes of the turnaround and try to get them to showcase what they're doing as validation points for the team. And not only is it really, really valuable training for everyone, 
but it's like, hey, you want to be the best? Like the best are revealing their secrets over here. So that's number one in terms of like making sure people know how to do it and are motivated properly to do it. But then there's like a systems aspect of it too. Is for example, like Aller can help with a lot of the stuff. There's a lot of insight that you can surface to your team, for example, right? In dashboards. And whether that's an Aller and Salesforce, what have you, right? The number one thing that we would try to do is as a sales leader, I knew the top five triggers for PAVE. And we tried to pull that data into CRM and surface those so you could always see those at the top of the account mm -hmm. and make it so that you almost didn't have to research accounts. Yeah. Right. Like if you just like looked at our five, top five triggers in our CRM, you'd be like, okay, like I, I barely even like have to go start digging for this stuff. And you can do that with all these like amazing da data tools, including the one that you all are offering as well. You can do this super, super, super easily. And it's on the leaders just like enable their teams to do that. Right. Um, and then the last piece is just making sure that you have like the right sequences that make it such that there are spots for tailoring in them is I would always include blank blocks and have a bank of trigger templates based on those top five. And I would encourage you all to be part of the solution and share those trigger templates, like pair up with two or three other reps and be like, we're going to write five trigger templates together and store those in a bank of your own. So you can do this stuff at scale and you can tailor cold emails in three minutes because it's just putting the different pieces together that you already have. I love that. I love that. I think we always talk about like, how do you prospect at scale, which is kind of like a contradictory statement, but you know, a yeah. lot of reps are held accountable to quotas and numbers. And even though I think that should shift more into a quality outreach um, yeah. narrative, uh, that's a great, that's a great way to do it is like create that data bank of your triggers and leave those into your um, cadence. So great. I love that. 100%. Any questions from anybody or any other thoughts you might add that I haven't asked you, Armand? <laughs> Let's see. There's a, so start dropping some questions in the chat because we got five minutes and we can go hog wild. So anything related to sales, getting replies, whatever is fair game. Um, I'm going to pull one up that Eric had a little bit earlier, which is the issue of calling cell phones versus office phones. Okay. This is like a real issue. So there are a couple tactics that you can use to get around this, but um, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to lie. It's, it, it's tougher, right? And there's not a silver bullet for like all of these office lines. The number one thing that you can do is don't make the same mistake twice. So on your first dials, usually like most sales engagement platforms, they have a way to mark something as red, yellow, or green, right? On your first dials, if you find that it's the right number, you hear a real voicemail, right? Or it goes to the person's voicemail. It doesn't buzz out. It's not an office line. Mark it as green. That means you're dialing it again. I would actually tag it as good, right? If you get an office line, if there's a dial by name directory, document the path, okay? Always document the path. That means if Alex's dial by name is star 3456 in the account or in the prospect notes on Alex's note, I know she's probably not going to answer, right? I need to document that dialing path so that next time I cold call, I can get there fast, right? If it's a dead end directory and there's no way, like it's not working or if it's just an office line or it's like a gatekeeper that you can't get past, right? Then I'm marking it as red and I'm tagging it as red and I'm never calling that number again. So before you start clearing out any of your tasks, I'll filter for anything that was an office line that's a dead end office line, clear those out. So I'm just calling mobiles all day, right? And so use your first dial to document the path and call all the garbage out so you never make the same mistake twice. Um, let's see some of the other questions that came up. Kelly had a good question, which is sweet spot. Amount of touches in a sequence, 15 to 20. Yeah, uh, 15 to 20 would be a good amount, but that's okay if you're spaced out multi-channel. I would say 10 to 14 touches over 30 days is that sweet spot. What that comes out to is... You figure you're sending an email every four days, give or take. So across 28 days, you're sending like seven emails, give or take. 28 divided by every four days, about seven emails. Everything else is calls in line with the first four emails. LinkedIn touches in line with the three LinkedIn touches total. A connection, a first message, and then a, a video or a final bubble up. I saw another question, which was, um, what is your favorite opener? Or I guess favorite it's opener. like top three. 
Yeah, I gave I gave you the two, which is the heard the name tossed around opener, and then the, and then the permission based opener. Nick has a third one, which is a twist of them both, which is the context first permission based opener. Um, which if I was cold calling today, which unfortunately I'm not, but I was cold calling like 12 months ago. Um, <laughs> if I was cold calling today, I'd give that one a spin. Basically, what it is is it mixes the heard the name tossed around opener context with the permission based opener. Sounds like this. It's like, hey, Alex. Uh, we work with a few other companies in the food and bev space like Coca-Cola. I know you weren't expecting my call. Can I get 30 seconds to tell you why I'm calling? And then you can tell me if this is relevant or not. It's Armand from 30 NPC. Yeah. So it's the context. Acknowledge it's a cold call. Introduce yourself. Mm -hmm. nice. um, okay. There's some other good ones. Which one do you want to pick? Um, let's do Mateo. Would you reach Mateo. to other sales reps at a company via LinkedIn? Seems like they're active, but obviously not your exact decision maker. Yeah. So there, there are two types of motions that could come from this. If you sell to a revenue organization, yes. If you do not sell to a revenue organization, maybe. So the vast majority of the way that we actually book meetings at 30 MPC is we reach out to the sales reps who've listened to our podcast, right? And we say, hey, I believe that Alex is the person that we need to get in front of, right? What do you think is the best way to get in front of Alex? Or what do you think the things that, uh, what do you think are the things that Alex cares about, right? Could you help out another sales rep, right? Sales rep to sales rep. That's easy when you're already selling to the revenue org mm -hmm. and usually we'll be able to get a referral, right? And as a sales rep, you're usually able to get a referral as well because salespeople like to help out other salespeople, right? If not, uh, let's say, for example, I'm selling fintech. And we, we'll go back to the Carta example. If I'm selling fintech and I need to get in front of a CFO, right? I could reach out to one of the sales reps and be like, hey, could you introduce me to your CFO? Uh, <laughs> I don't know if it's going to work, right? It doesn't really impact their org. They probably don't want to burn that political capital. But what you can do is you can ask that salesperson what the finance person is saying in all hands, or you can ask them for things that the finance team really cares about that they would put into a cold email. So you can use, you can essentially have firsthand research by reaching out to other sales reps as a friendly place. And by the way, Alex, I know we, I don't have a hard stop. So if we want to keep going a little bit, that's fine. Because I know we had some technical difficulties. There's some good, some questions, good questions here, but totally your call. No, no, no. Let's really really good some questions. good questions. Um, no, that was, that's a really helpful thing. I didn't even think about it that way. Um, there's another really great one from Joshua. How do you determine if it's worth your time to speak or connect with a high ranking board member of a firm that doesn't directly align with who you sell to, but are willing to chat? Wow. You're booking meetings with board members. Good for you. Right. <laughs> or we can like, you yeah. know, use this in another, you know, context. Maybe you're selling into, you know, the heads of sales, but you're talking to a marketing exec or somebody else, right? Uh, yeah. How can you weave that conversation in? For sure. So that's the it's essentially the parallel executive motion. So I typically wouldn't recommend for example, if I sell to a CMO, I wouldn't recommend going and prospecting the CTO, <laughs> right? Just by virtue of time, unless like you, you have like two accounts and you just have to knock on every door, I wouldn't recommend doing that, right? There are two nuances. There's a lateral and then there's a vertical, right? So the lateral example, you can go one step removed. So for example, we may prospect at 30 MPC into a CRO or into a VP of sales when we sell into the marketing team. And again, we're going to use that one as a mechanism to gain intel on how top of funnel and pipeline is going, but then two as a credible referral to who is typically the counterpart to our main buyer, right? If it's way too many steps removed, I would recommend like not doing that. The vertical one, which is the board member piece, is the board typically oversees the CEO, right? So if you can get a meeting with a board member, that's awesome. I'd be surprised if it, it would be like a traditional like venture board because those folks are even more busy oftentimes than the executives. But the key thing that you want to go for there is see if you can figure out if there are other companies that they're board members on. Usually board members are board members for a few companies and see if you've helped any of their 
other portfolio companies, right? And bring that to the table as your proof point and ask them for the inside scoop on if there are parallel types of problems either with this prospect or with other prospects mm -hmm. that they are board members for. That's a great, that's a great strategy. I didn't think about that. Let's see. What else have we got? I've got a few more questions. Armand, do you see on. strikes your fans? Bulk subject line. <laughs> I haven't had a good one. No, it's, it's a super important one because do I use bulk subject lines? Absolutely. Right. So um, we haven't talked about this. A, B, and C tier accounts. A tier uh, almost always gets personalization. B tier, I'm usually taking accounts and the most relevant contacts on the B tier account are going to get personalization. So let's use 30 MPC as an example. A tier account, right? Blue chip, creme de la creme. Every marketer that I reach out to is like part of this narrative in the story and it's like super, super tailored. B tier, CMO, head of content, head of demand gen, whoever I think is going to be the champion or Nick thinks is going to be the champion plus the executive sponsor, all tailored. Everyone else below the line or other folks who like might be involved are going to get more like company level tailoring or persona based tailoring, which is like targeted at their department, but not necessarily at them. C tiers, um, which are like folks that have, have very, un very unlikely propensity to buy, but I should still work them because they're in my territory if they're raised their hand, right? Those folks are going to get largely templated stuff, right? And that includes templated subject lines. However, what you can do is you can bucket these folks together and still have semi-tailored subject lines. So what I would do is I would be like, today is Sequoia Capital Portfolio Day. And I would be like, the, comp the subject line was their company, my company, Sequoia. And so I could send that to 200 people, but it's semi-targeted, mm -hmm. right? You can do the same thing for personas. You can do the same thing for uh, an industry or competitor camp campaign if you were using Aller, where if I'm selling to food and bev, right, I might be able to use that same like Coca-Cola subject line with 20 other food and bev co's, right? And so you can write subject lines that scale, but try to carve a slice of the market to templatize a subject line. Otherwise, I'm tailoring most of my subject lines. And if I have to use a super templated one, it's usually just my company name slash their company name or my first name slash their first name, um, as opposed to automate your blah, blah, blah resources, which is a garbage subject line that is selling. Morgan Morgan Ingram talks about my company name and your company. That's a popular one. So yeah, uh, it's, it's neutral. <laughs> in my opinion. Cool. Um, let's see. Question on video creation. Do you create videos just in LinkedIn directly or using Vidyard or... Um, Loom, what do you, what do you, what's your preference? I like using some sort of platform by virtue of being able to track clicks. Mm. The nice part is LinkedIn allows you to do native videos. And sometimes those are a little bit lower friction, but I prefer to track clicks. Um, so to me, the value of having them click out or the, like the pain of having them click out is still not painful enough that it is worth me dropping the fact that I can see who's clicked on a video, mm -hmm. especially for mid deal cycle videos. Yes. Like I want to see if a, I can tell if a proposal is being forwarded around mid deal cycle by how many times people are opening up my proposal video. And there's another tip for you. That's some pseudo related to the question, which is if you're ever sending a proposal, never send it out over PDF. Um, unless it's truly just like a recap that you've discussed it live. Anyone's like, give me pricing over the phone, over email and you can't get them on phone. They won't take a meeting. Always send a video. And you will be able to see how many people look at that freaking proposal, even if they're ghosting you. And it's the easiest telltale sign of a ghost, right? Of, of a ghost who's just doing it as part of the negotiation is they keep watching the video, but they're not replying. That's really fascinating. I, I didn't even, I didn't even think about that. That's some really good insight. Um, cool. And then Vidyard and Loom lets you track those clicks or? Just... Any major video okay. platform will let Vidyard, Loom, Drift Video, Etc. Oh, that's that's great. Um, and then again, once again, anyone who's asking, this recording will be shared. I think we're wrapping up. Um, any closing remarks, Armand? The uh, the biggest thing that I would say today, folks, is the the money is made in 
the inverted funnel today. So companies 12 months ago were defaulting to buy software and now they're defaulting to cut software. And before you could just like send a million emails and you, you'd send 100 emails, you get 10 replies, right? Can't do that anymore, unfortunately. The reps that I find are finding success today are, this is not just a pitch for tailoring emails. This is a pitch for focusing on the right parts of your territory, okay? You're going to chase C-tier deals all day and they're not going to buy in this kind of market. The best reps out there, they're finding who are the people that are buying today they're inverting those triggers and they're going deep and wide into those accounts because you're going from 80% of your territory being willing to buy to 20% of your territory maybe being willing to take a meeting today. And so you're better off going deep into the folks who have those triggers and having the data to find which accounts those are and going all out on those because those are the 20 that are going to get you to President's Club, right? It's not spamming the 80% of your territory that frankly is probably going to go out of business right now. And Evan asked about emojis in the subject lines. I wouldn't recommend doing it because it's cheeky and it comes off as salesy <laughs> as one final capstone. No emojis, <laughs> especially poop emojis. No that. Awesome. Thank you, everyone. That's a wrap. We had the amazing Armand Farouk here and we'll share the recording out with everybody. Thanks for joining us. Awesome. Thanks, folks. Catch you soon.